How do we want to start? <laughs> okay. So here's here's the thing. I actually have I want okay. I need your advice slash thoughts on something that is somewhat related to camp aesthetic. Um, which is I am going out tomorrow night with my friend Owen for Pride. I don't know what to wear because I want to be like I want to be femme. I want to be like high femme, like camp pink all over the place. I don't have a lot of things that are pink though. Knowing of the stuff that I have, is there anything that you think um, screams bimbo? Do you have like any like short skirts? Like really short skirts? Uh, Like kind of, but nothing that's fitted. I have that one like kind of plaid skirt that has the um the zipper in the front i guess i could do that skirt i don't know where that is though (sighs) maybe i'll send you some pics later maybe i'll try i'll try on a couple of different things and i'll send you i'll send you some pics (laughs) this is our this is our preamble it's just hey spamuel can you give me some fashion advice should we get started? What do you have anything else you might want to talk about? I think we, we should we should get started. Hello and welcome to It's Giving Camp. I'm Saffron. And I'm Fabiola. And this week we're talking about Valley of the Dolls. Movie from 1967. Yes. Not Beyond Valley of the Dolls. Which is the sequel, I That's guess. for another episode. It's billed as a sequel, but it's also, like, completely different, with completely different characters. When I mentioned to my family that that's, this is what we were watching and talking about today, my dad was like, Beyond Valley of the Dolls? Because that's camp. And I was like, no, no, no. Wait, I think that's a completely They're different both thing. camp in different ways, and they yeah. each deserve their own episode. <laughs> okay, so we're starting with the first one. We're t- starting with, um, it was, it's 1967, you said, or 1968? 1967. We had watched it before, like, way, like, was it s- sophomore year? Yeah. I think right the- before the pandemic. <laughs> Oh God, it was right before the pandemic. I remember, I don't remember really, I think I felt like very neutral about it when we watched it the first time. I remember, I remember you said that you liked it. I think I liked it, but it, it didn't stick with me. It until I was rewatching this and I realized multiple like visual moments I was like, wait, that's where this is from. Because I remember, like, I was like, oh, like, I've seen a movie where there's, like, like, dancing or rehearsal for some production. And I remember, like, kind of the layout of this room. And I couldn't remember what movie it was. It was this movie. It was the scene with the, you know, the Jen in the, the big headdress. So there were, there were visual moments that I remember. I also remembered, like, the pool scene um with the with when when jennifer comes and visits and is talking to mel and and neely by the pool i hadn't remembered any of the content of the scene i just remembered the visuals of them sitting by the pool um this is all my 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 way of saying is that the first time uh it didn't stick but this time it did, and I love this movie now. I am obsessed with it. <laughs> yeah, and I had like watched it once before. I watched it with you, and like both of those those times, I I just liked that movie. But like, I feel like now I like I get the humor in it. <laughs> I I think it is fascinating is the thing especially in 
like to just talk about how femininity and gender is portrayed in this film is I feel like there's so so many layers to it um and Neely is such a fun character Neely is very much the MVP of this movie (laughs) and like we can spend so much time talking about her (laughs) yeah so where do you want to start do you want to start with talking about her I feel like I I feel like I want to start with like some background info because I feel like background info specifically for this movie helps frame a lot of the discussion go for it yes please so basically a lot of this is from um brody deschanel's video valley of the dolls why we love this awful movie and so it's based on a book by Jacqueline Zusan and the, the one of the things about this movie is that even though it looks like the 60s, the book is technically, it technically opens in 1945 and spans like a few decades. <laughs> Meanwhile, it doesn't feel like it in the movie. No, it seems like the movie, the plot of the movie takes place in maybe three years, it feels like. Well, it's, it's, it's supposed to be at least a decade. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> apparently <laughs> and so and I, I noted that neely is inspired by judy garland and the book became the fastest selling book in history at the time because it was like really salacious gossipy material and it featured lesbian love affairs explicit language queer men and abortion wait where are the gay people? Some some parts of that are not present in the movie. <laughs> so where are the gay people? Well, um, the explanation is that the explanation is that early on, Fox, as in 20th Century Fox, assured to the public that it would be making a tasteful adaptation, hoping to frame it as a morality tale to sway younger audiences away from its more lurid themes. So that's why there's no gay people. Well, I guess I just need to go read the book now because <laughs> that that makes me that makes me sad. I did not know I could have I was missing out. <laughs> and um the writer for the movie Dorothy Kingsley was known for quote writing clean Hollywood scripts. Hmm. But is it even that clean of a film? Compared to the book, apparently. I but, see. like, basically 20th Century Fox wanted to, like, profit off of the fame of the book while still being, like, respectable. And it all, she also says that Kingsley's primary objective was to omit the book's more adult subversive content in favor of a moral approach to prediction as a social issue. I think the only thing that I knew about this film or like the, part of the ways you you part of the way you explained it to me the first time we watched it was saying like oh Sharon Tate's in it. Yeah. Like Sharon Tate is very, very much like part of like the mythos of the movie considering how her character is pretty similar to like at least to how she was perceived and like her character also dies young. Mm -hmm. And another like interesting casting thing is that Judy Garland was brought on to play Helen Lawson, but was fired. And I really wish she wasn't fired because it would make like, such a cool meta narrative with the scenes between Helen and Neely. That would have been so interesting because I genuinely, when watching it, the credits, the 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 Helen Lawson character is is billed last, and I don't know the actress who plays her. She's played by Susan Hayward, I think. She's another like old Hollywood actress, but not as like difficult on set as Judy Garland. 
I like when watching it, it was like, oh man, like I wonder if there is a um like kind of cultural reference that I'm missing um by not knowing that actor as well that there's that there could be a meta narrative there with the actor playing Helen Lawson being similar to the character but so that's really interesting to find out that there could have been a character uh, an actor who I still have the cultural reference for today um but it was I guess uh reality uh was just a little too close to to the fiction and they it wasn't worth it to keep Judy Garland around yeah and like in in Rowie's video like she also said that like a lot of people were like hiring Judy was probably like a publicity stunt since she was like only like she only lasted like three days Mm. on the project Mm. But like it would have been really cool to see Judy Garland fighting with a character inspired by her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like basically with all that in mind, a lot of the um camp value of the movie comes from like it's needed to be respectable and that like backfiring essentially it was a flaw right yeah like a lot of the negative reviews were a lot of the negative reviews were basically stating that like it's it's really scared of the source material and that's why it doesn't work do you think it works it works when appropriated by the fandom exactly because I had so much fun watching this film. I'm sure there's differences between people who found ways to enjoy it, like when it came out and like people who are familiar with the book, like still finding enjoyment in the film versus new viewers like us who see it decades later with potentially without that cultural context who also find ways to enjoy it. Yeah, like this this movie does have enough to like grasp onto regardless of like what it is that you end up grasping onto. I mean, it's it it's helpful that it's an ensemble cast. Yeah. With us since we're like seeing it through like a camp lens where we've already brought up Neely multiple times and she's the most camp character for reasons we'll have to get into. <laughs> but I mean, I'd argue that Jennifer is also quite camp. Yeah, like not just with the weird parallels to Sharon Tate, but also like in the way that she talks about herself. The way she talks about herself. Also, some of her line deliveries are just odd. <laughs> like, what was it? Um, my- other, I know I have no talent. <laughs> she like has some line like that witch should boil. That's like really, it's such an <laughs> odd line delivery. It's I had to write it down. The line where where she, where um, Jennifer says the f word. <laughs> oh my god! At the pool, <laughs> there was. Okay, this is this that is a question, a, 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 a cultural context question I have, which is, um, is that like era appropriate casual homophobia? I think so. Like this is pre Stonewall. Okay, <laughs> it's it, that's not part of the kind of campiness. That's just like, yeah, okay, that's just how they were talking. They talk about gay people. So like not only is it pre Stonewall, it's also supposed to be the nineteen forties and fifties. But the fashion doesn't look forties and fifties. No, no. But like, that's one of the that's one of like the really camp things about this movie because this this movie really, like, I was thinking a lot about like things being what they're not, 
mm. with this movie and one of the one of the things that is very much in tandem with that is how even though everything looks incredibly 60s the way that like the the show business is operating it's operating in a way that wasn't like i'm pretty sure it wasn't like that in the 60s there definitely feels like there's a disconnect between the scenes in both broadway and hollywood where it's behind the stage production that feels at odds with everything else, I guess. <laughs> Cause yeah, the the way they're shooting, the, the scene with Neely shooting the Western, where she gets really, you know, upset and locks herself in her trailer. The way that kind of sound stage wasn't being used by the time it was like 1967 right yeah yeah the 60s like especially the late 60s like filmmaking got more naturalistic which meant less usage of sound stages and yeah that scene felt particularly 50s (laughs) yeah oh it's too hot Cut. Stand by. Well, it's too hot. It's too damn hot. The cameraman's frying me. Neely. Neely. Shut up! She's full of sauce. It's not booze. It's pills. Send for a husband. Look, Neely. The, the aspect of camp that I kept thinking about with this film is, like, the uh, exaggerated portrayals of gender and femininity, which feels... Um, which is nice because we have been talking, we we were talking more about exaggerated portrayals of masculinity. And so now we get to talk about some exaggerated portrayals of femininity. The sense of like how in the order that we've recorded episodes, which isn't necessarily the order in which they will be released. But yeah, in recording order, we have been talking a lot about exaggerated masculinity so a little preview for what we'll be releasing next week, hopefully when you listen to this, will be our Supernatural episode. And Valley of the Dolls and Supernatural is not the double feature I was expecting, but it ends up being a really interesting <laughs> comparison in some ways. Who's the Dean of Who's Valley the of the dean? Dolls? <laughs> I mean... I would argue that Jennifer is the dean yeah. of the dolls. And Anne is, feels like the Sam. <laughs> <laughs> She's the only one who gets to live the normal life. It makes sense. It does. Okay. I know we're like skipping ahead all around, skipping all around with like chronology of the plot, but as much as Anne is kind of like the boring character, I love how she ends the film. I love that she, she leaves- exits her own house. <laughs> she leaves her own house and just walks into the snow. In the and then song. she grabs a random <laughs> stick and is just waving it around. And the song. The goddamn song that plays five times by Dion Warwick, Twitter legend. <laughs> Do you have thoughts on Anne? Um, I I did take note of her, like how she keeps insisting on marriage throughout the film, which I thought was like interesting and part of like the. F- canon is like women are expected to like not only get married but to actively want marriage and like that that's what stuck out to me about Anne and also the the like makeup brand ad that she did yeah which was wild <laughs> especially considering how like at first the the guy from the brand is like 
we don't want artificial beauty. But then that ad is like putting her in wigs. Yeah, these huge wigs and makeup she usually isn't wearing in the film. Yeah, all of the (laughs) montages, like the showbiz montages are so camp. They're so performative, so fabricated, so colorful and bright. In the 60s. Yeah. The very 60s, which adds to how it's written like it's the 40s or and 50s, but it's presented like the 60s. But okay, going back to Anne's desire of marriage, that's like the the deeper reason why i love her ending so much like obviously it's silly like the actual like staging of it but it felt really liberating that in this movie that does feel like it's trying to pitch a morals that is trying to say like oh these are the the sad tragic women and how they get addicted to pills and it's really sad and Anne's the one who who sticks on through and and pulls herself up and gets out of this awful industry. The fact that she then still is her own woman at the end, that yes, she goes home, but she doesn't marry, she doesn't settle down, she does make her own path, was really a bit of a relief, honestly. Yeah, like, at least it it does feel like her character has, like, grown over the course of the film. Yeah, and she realizes that marriage is just something that she thinks is supposed to make her happy and not something that will actually make her happy. I'm I'm glad she didn't marry that guy because he was kind of a mess. Does that mean you won't marry me? It wouldn't work, Lion. Isn't there anything I can do to change your mind? No, Lion, not now. Anne. Perhaps someday, Lion, I don't know. Goodbye. I was gonna, well, I was gonna say that none of the men are interesting in this film, and that's not true, because I love Tony. Yeah, Tony's, Tony's like, the one discernible man, because he's paralyzed. Like, he's, he's like, the most (laughs) developed man in terms of, like, character arc. Sorry, I don't- The big part of that is because he's in a wheelchair. (laughs) That's how I can tell him apart (laughs) from the other men in this movie. (laughs) <laughs> you're not wrong but you could have phrased that a bit more tastefully just yeah he's paralyzed that's how i know he's a man <laughs> but i think there's like a sweetness to him and a, a authenticity yeah. yeah the scene with him and neely was cute yeah, it's so cute. And like also the very first scene that he's in where he he's singing that song in the nightclub and he's singing it to Jennifer. I'm like, this is like romantic. I like this. Um, I will also say Miriam's a little bit of a girl boss. I think she should have deserved more screen time. I want to know her deal. I I feel like she she was one of the like eliminated lesbians from the book i have oh my i have that inkling miriam's not gonna like that who's miriam his sister over there she manages him she does very well he won't make a move without her he's making one now As a way to kind of transition from talking 
about Anne to talking about Neely and Jen, one of the things that I um, really liked that does, um, again, is like, it speaks to kind of like the kinds of characters and, and authentic emotion that I like in my, I just like personally enjoy media, but also it speaks to like the uh, disorienting sense of time in the film is the girl's friendship. Um, where on one hand, I'm like, oh, this is really sweet that they like still keep in touch and, you know, care about each other. But then on the other hand, it's like, wait, how much time has passed? Why? Neely is winning Grammys? What, what has Jen been up to? Like, what is going on? <laughs> like in between scenes, a lot is happening that we do not see. Yeah. And so it's suddenly like, Oh, Neely has a Grammy. <laughs> and I, it is a little, I don't know. Could you really like, sh like appear on like a telethon one night and then suddenly like get deal after deal after deal and become a star? Or is just like Lion supposed to be a really good agent? Like how, how realistic is that? How exaggerated is that? I mean, I mean, it's, it's things being what they are not. <laughs> so true. I mean, I don't watch this film for, um, I don't watch the film for- For seeking out plot holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I don't watch the film for like coherence. I watch the film for, line reading like uh boobies 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 <laughs> every single thing that neely says is iconic it's so good it's so good it's the i forgot about and, like that. apparently apparently um according to the Burry de chanel video um patty duke said that she kind of gave up on the character early on and i was like this is you giving up? <laughs> what kind of an insane performance were you going to give? Maybe part of the reason it's so good is because she's not putting, like, effort into it. And so it, it I don't know. how She's, like, it... not taking it super seriously. Yeah. That's... And I feel like that's what makes her performance really good. It she's makes it just, so like, fun. going, like, Oh, I will, I will just, I will just say things. <laughs> like when she flushes the, the wig and she's like, bye, pussycat. What the hell are you doing in there? Giving it a shampoo. Goodbye, pussycat. God, she's throwing it in the can. I'll kill her. But they are, they're iconic lines. They're so repeat, re repeatable. They're so memeable. Yeah. You should make like a super cut of a bunch of things Neely says. Well, we have to add some Jen lines in yeah. there too, because I love yeah. the, it's like the, you know, any, anytime Jen talks about her body, it's, it's fascinating. And, and they're, the lines are also delivered with this kind of like, they're delivered. It's very, very it is what it is. She's yeah. like, oh, it is what it is. <laughs> That is kind of one of my favorite character, female character types is the character who knows they're dumb and pretty and they don't care because they're dumb and pretty. Yeah, yeah, Jen is very like, well, there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> and on one hand, it does make the ending, like her, her, the ending is tragic and it is upsetting that she thinks if she doesn't have her body, she doesn't have anything and, and she can't continue living. But I don't blame her. Yeah. If it was a more serious film, there could be a very like interesting, there could be really interesting exploration of show business and, and, and the like, uh exploitation not that necessarily exploitation of women's bodies because if they want to you know how do i word this the 
gender struggles of the women are also deeply tied to class struggles. Yeah, like specifically like with Jen, like she has her ending because without her body, she wouldn't be employed and without her employment, she can't pay for Tony's um, treatment. Or take care of her her mom and her Yeah. And if Valley of the Dolls was a more serious film, there could be a depth there. There could be, like, so much to talk about. And I do think modern audiences, or or, uh, uh, I do think interested audience members can, like, pull those pieces apart and talk about them themselves. But the, the moral that I take away and the criticism that I feel like there is of Hollywood and show business and the, the like greed of producers at the harm of the actors, all of that that I see in there, I'm not sure how much of it is intentional by the filmmakers. I, I do not think it was intentional because Rui did note in her video that like a lot of the practices on set were very similar to like the experiences that the women had in the film. Mm. So like she says that the reason the film could never succeed is because it was created by a team of people who actively worked to realign it along the conservative norms of establishment Hollywood. So like even though it's kind of criticizing it it's not like it still very much wants to be a part of Hollywood and that includes at the time like mistreating its worker like I have so much sympathy empathy for um I have so much empathy for Neely and the monologue that she gives Anne about how she's overworked and doesn't have enough time to sleep and it really is there is a there is a sadness at the core of it that that is um while i have so much like fun with the the over dramatic line readings I think what really compels me about Neely's character is her, the tragedy of her Um, and the like fresh, the genuine frustration that of the situation that she's in, even if she is also overdramatic and that causes part of it. She's also like, in some ways she's right. They, they do overwork her and mistreat her. Yeah, like, like the the sadness and the tragedy is, I think, very much part of the camp. Considering like how how she's very much entirely based on Judy Garland, who is a camp icon not only because she's like her presence screams star, but also because she was like abused throughout her entire life essentially with how she was overworked and fed drugs constantly and there's this really good line from the Broy video in which she quotes them Kane can fail which says the new camp of the AIDS activist generation identified with decrepit bodies and damaged divas mm. And like, it is very much a pattern of camp icons and gay icons that they they hold in themselves both a, a sense of glamor and stardom, but also of tragedy. Mm-hmm. And it's that blend and juxtaposition which fully makes a camp icon. And in that way, I think Jen and Neely are both camp icons. Yeah. And it also helps explain why Anne isn't 
Yeah. Because she's like, not only is she like the most well adjusted of the group, but also because she has a happy mm-hmm. end. Even though she she also gets caught up in the showbiz and she also starts using dolls, she breaks out of that cycle. And I think part of the way she's able to break out of the cycle is because she, she, yeah, she is, I don't know, from the, be- from the beginning, she is characterized as being different. Um, not that she could have been a similar uh, star in the way that um, Neely and Jen were. I mean, I, she's just as attractive and probably could be just as talented, but the people in her life, the, the men, the managers, they push her in the direction to be different. They push her in the way they expect her to be, um, you know, on top of things. And uh, and even when she becomes the, the Gillian girl, it's, she, it's pitched in a way that she's, you know, like got that natural average beauty. So she never, um, she doesn't get addicted to pills the same way that Neely does because she isn't expected to use them and and encouraged to use them by the producers in her life. And also like with the like, the intentions of the filmmakers, like they also, clearly needed a, a role model character and mm-hmm. Anne is a pretty clear choice and so that's another reason why she gets a happy ending because she's the one that the filmmakers think like not only deserves it but also she needs to be an example a positive example for the audience mm-hmm. this need for for her to be the positive role model for the movie from the filmmakers is one of the reasons why I think she's the one who gets least remembered from the movie. Yeah. It's quite ironic, huh? That the kinds of characters that um, certain kinds of producers want audience members to take away are never the ones that stick in people's minds if you want to have an interesting character or if you want to have a quote-unquote good character they have to be boring (laughs) so that you can project yourself onto them and that's also the power of naive camp do you say that because you think Anne is naive camp? No, like the film itself is naive camp in the sense that the filmmakers clearly wanted the audience to identify with Anne, but the audience ended up identifying with Jen and Neely because they are more interesting than her and yeah. like are more performative than her. Mother, I know I don't have any talent, and I know all I have is a body, and I am doing my best exercises. Goodbye, Mother. I'll wire you the money first thing in the morning. Goodbye. Do we want to talk about Neely? Well, I want to talk about Neely and how she's the other part of things not being what they are. Yeah. Which... Basically, um, Patty Duke, who plays Neely um, in, in Broey's video, she states that Patty was 20 when they made the movie, which I think is really interesting that she was 20 because as the film progresses, she's essentially playing a washed up actress. My mouth so, is literally like, hanging agape 
That's that, a twenty-year-old playing a washed-up actress, <laughs> and like watching this movie, knowing that she is twenty. Like I'm like, yeah, I can tell that she she looks really young. She does look really young, but I didn't think she's twenty. But they have her acting like she's she's in her thirties. Damn, I'm just like staring at a screenshot of her now because I'm like, damn. <laughs> He's younger than us in this movie. <laughs> yeah, this the scene that like really highlights the the juxtaposition of her age and how she's performing is the the pool scene where she catches um her husband with another woman. Mm. And like just the way she speaks and her mannerisms are like very much like they feel like diva in her 30s meanwhile the way she looks she has like this very petite body but she also has like big hair and the nails and i'm like this this is an image (laughs) well the other strange juxtaposition is that it's like this is what her second marriage well into her second marriage and it, it's supposed to be like oh you know you never made me feel like a like a man and uh, they're 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 supposed to have been like a, a, together for a long time and it's gotten old and jaded and we don't we didn't see any of that. We don't see any of that. And she doesn't look like she's this older woman. She doesn't. Um, but she's supposed to be. She is supposed <laughs> to be. Do they really, th- they really thought they were doing something, huh? The filmmakers really are like, yeah, we got this. <laughs> let's, let's cast a 20 year old as a washed up pill addicted actress. <laughs> I mean, uh... To give them benefit of the doubt, I do think it is hard to cast for a movie that is supposed to span multiple years. Um, Yeah. That does seem difficult to try to find an actress who can be both young and washed up. Because on an either age, something is going to look off. Yeah. But also, like... By the end of the movie, she still looks really young, even though they have her wear, like, this big hair and coats. And, like, she just, she doesn't really look washed up. She just acts really drunk throughout, like, the second half of the movie. (laughs) She does act very drunk. I mean, and I'll say this. We're talking about this, but we love it. (laughs) Yeah. Neely, Neely character of all time, Neely performance of all time, and and it's because she's played by a twenty year old. <laughs> yeah. Boobies, boobies, boobies. Nothing but boobies. Who needs them? I did great without them. I want to talk uh, briefly about the other pool scene um if you're okay the one yeah uh because the I one find... where jen is in the pink and green outfit that i love yeah and and mel is typing on his typewriter um i found that entire sequence so fascinating um i think the way that they like Mel says like one thing, you know, Mel Mel tells Jen, oh, she's changed. And then he goes inside and Neely comes out and he's like, oh, he's changed. I find that so fun. But I find the the fact that what finally pushes Mel away that makes him go, oh, I'm fed up. I should have left years ago is when she undermines his masculinity in the comment about how uh he he says something like um i'm not your butler and she goes well you're not the the breadwinner either yeah and 
that I think is part of the interesting gender dynamics of this film is while and another like contradiction in it in that yes like neely is this woman she's this actress and the money that neely makes is because she is a woman um and a lot of the stress and pressure that she faces at the studios is due to the fact that she's a woman but at the same time she is making lots of money in this position of power and wealth that um is more quote unquote you know traditionally masculine and it does seem that that's part of the unspoken um frustration in uh mel and neely's relationship i also think that's uh that idea of the the woman being the breadwinner um the star is also in the case with um jen and tony but for like in her case she has no choice but to be a breadwinner yeah like i as much as neely i feel like should be uh allowed to be the sole earner and excel and and at at i also think jen should be allowed to just like stay home and be the pretty housewife and it sucks that she doesn't get to be yeah like especially like when jen starts doing the art films like she doesn't feel like entirely comfortable with it but it could also it might be like both that the characters aren't entirely comfortable with it but also the filmmakers wanted to show that she's uncomfortable with it so the audience could be uncomfortable with it. Yeah. Okay, because I wanted to talk about that. Because that, the shot of Jen when they're, she's in France and she's watching the cut of the latest film and she is like sitting back in the chair. And she's like, I think she's wearing a dress but with a blazer over it and smoking yeah. a cigar and looks really like powerful and in control um and i was like this is that feels like like i'm sex positive i'm pro porn like i i feel like that is something that she it would be great that if she feels empowered by it and visually in the shot it looks like she is but then the very next moment, as soon as like the film ends and she starts talking, she's like, I hate this, I wanna go home. And I was like, yeah, it did really feel to me like there was a, that was morality that was coming from the studio and didn't need to be necessary to the character because the character throughout all of that up until that moment, Jen's been like, yeah, I have my body and that's what I use and that's what I focus on. And yeah, like until that moment, she's just been like, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, she's been <laughs> fine with it. And so why, why can't she still be fine with it? Something we have to ask the filmmakers. <laughs> I mean, we know why. Yeah. <laughs> They have uh, also offered to buy your contract. Does that mean I can go home? Well, I'm not sure I wish to sell. Oh, Claude, you'll make lots of money. True, but uh, you will get half. I just want to go back to America and see Tony. Of what use is a man who is no longer a man, eh? a vegetable? Claude, please stop it. I've hated this. Can find yourself another girl as much as i love neely um i think the the uh disregard she has for the work that jen does is interesting and um yeah yeah the not like other girls jumped out 
Oh yeah. <laughs> I, that probably comes from the 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 filmmaker's own morality, but also that is the case with 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 real women and some women are yeah do think that it should be all about talent and you shouldn't have to use your body and it's like look that's the way the industry works though and there's also nothing wrong with being in a film topless yeah i think neely's character arc in relation to her addiction is really interesting because like at rehab she's like yeah all these insane methods of rehabilitating me have worked but then she very much falls back on it again meanwhile Anne's rehabilitation is one scene long and it consists of her laying on the beach that comparison really shows that uh the addiction storylines in this story aren't for the sake of telling an addiction storyline they're for the sake of um a moral yeah, like it really did feel like the movie was like Neely is inherently incapable of getting better, meanwhile, and being a better person is capable of doing that and much more quickly at that. Which, okay, can I just say, not only is that fucked up, that also just doesn't feel like good like you're not they didn't flesh out the world like there wasn't enough world build or uh, character development because we we don't get to know anything of really about neely's life before she was uh like on that in the, that one broadway play she's she's instantly a star like the first time we see her she is performing we don't we don't and we never get to learn anything about like what kind of family she comes from, what, you know, what her interests are outside of being a star. Uh, we know her in kind of association with various relationship with men, but if they're trying to say that Neely O'Hara is inherently bad, there is no, there's nothing that they can correlate to her being like inherently a problem other than the fact that she's just is that she's a star and she wants things to go her way and that's a problem and that's the that's the only thing that they it doesn't feel like they're giving anything to really like there's not really anything else that they're condemning her for it's just who she is she's the way she is and that is wrong and and camp comes in to go know the way she is is there's value in the way that she is and she's she's relatable but she's also very entertaining in her performance yeah i feel like mary lee and and um neely are, are very similar in some ways it's just that in written on the wind cirque knew that it was tragic yeah it's it's deliberate and naive camp i want to briefly like in relation to all of what we just said um neely's scene at the end when she's in like the empty alleyway like it's both very she's giving the performance of a lifetime but it's also mood <laughs> nah. watching that scene i was like did patty duke lose her voice making the scene because i would lose my voice i mean that's how that, big of a performance it is is she actually singing when she sings probably because if she has voice training she probably knows how to to scream in a way that doesn't hurt yeah but still 
that rawness, you feel it. I'm not sure if I feel the rawness, but I do feel her vocal cords. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> Also, I, th- I thought it was really fun that Neely herself describes something as camp. Oh, yeah. I forgot <laughs> to mention that. Yeah. Like specifically the dance at the sanatorium. And I was like, yeah, that is that is camp. It's it's definitely performing. <laughs> I think that might be it. Yay. You can find us on Twitter at Giving Camp Pod and on Instagram at It's Giving Camp Pod. And that's all lowercase one word. Our theme music that you are listening to right now is by Harrison Murray. I'm Saffron Heftigal. I'm on online at Gal Hefta. And I'm Fabiola Liano. And you can find me on Twitter at Fabiola underscore Liana. Shout out to our patron, Nicole Bonetto. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoy your podcast, please recommend it to your friends.